Welcome to another episode from Mission Community Church AV. Thank you for joining us on YouTube or on the podcast. We invite you to subscribe to both the podcast and our YouTube channel and visit our Facebook page. We are also on Instagram. Links to these sites are in the description below this video. It is our hope that this message from the Word of God will bring comfort, encouragement, and conviction to your heart that you may be blessed in your walk with God. Join us now as Pastor Cody Jennison continues our study in the New Testament book of Colossians. Open your Bibles to Colossians chapter 3, verses 3 and 4, as we begin our study of Seeking Christ. Amen. Good to be with you, praising the name of the Lord our God, praising Christ together. When you were in school, or if you are in school now, I wonder how often you heard different questions, and of course, a healthy environment, the teacher probably said something like, please ask questions, right? There, there's, no, there's no such thing as a dumb question. Ask questions, right? But when I think back on the time of my education, I think the most common question I got, or at least I heard, either asked by my peers or heard from students as I was a teacher was, why do we have to do this? To which at that point I thought, okay, TJ, clearly there are tough questions, right? Clearly. But that was the most common thing. The most common pursuit of school and education, it dominates your early years and it's all you know. You eat, sleep, and drink, and you wake up and it's back to school and it's back to homework and it's just this pounding wave against your life or so you feel. As a child, why do we have to go to school? Why do we have to do this assignment? Why do we have to do this? Over and over and over. And then you get the different lectures that would come. Some teachers would just smart talk back and say, because you don't want to end up with on the streets, right? Or something like that. And then your parents would maybe take a little more time to explain what education does for you and the, uh, the opportunities it might open up for you and that kind of thing. Well, when you think about what we covered last week in Colossians 3 verses 1 and 2, we summarized it with a, a really simple fact. If you are a Christian, if you're a follower of Christ, you have a simple responsibility and resolve, and that is to see Christ. That's it. If you are living in that reality that you have died and you are now risen to newness of life, spiritually speaking, with Christ, then you have one thing on your mind. Seek Christ. Seek Christ. And if you've been walking in the faith for any length of time, you might be thinking, I get that a lot. That's the pounding kind of uh, resolve that keeps coming. My direction is, are you seeking Christ? Are you in the Word? Are you in prayer? How are you doing? Are you seeking Christ? And perhaps you could, like those children in education, say, why do we have to do this? Why? I, keep, I get it. The imperative keeps coming. The command keeps coming. I need to see Christ. But why? And so this morning, I want to I treat you like children and address that. Why? Why must you see Christ? Why do you get to see Christ? I want to give you some motivations this morning. Motivations for why you should be eager and filled with joy to see Christ. I want to give you some fuel, some ammunition. To be able to say, yes, my responsibility is to see Christ, and I'm all about it. And there's plenty of reasons why. I think we'll find those reasons because Paul lays them out for us in our text in the next few verses, in Colossians 3, verses 3 and 4. Well, let's read the text as a whole. Let's start verse 1 again. Colossians 3, verse 1, and I'll read through verse 4. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. This morning, I just want to give you four motivations, four reasons why we see Christ. Four motivations that Paul goes directly into in our text, right after telling us and making that clear that that's our responsibility and that's our resolve is to see Christ, the things above, not the things on earth. Why? Four motivations, four, four reasons for why we do that. So let's begin in our text and start in verse 3, the, the first half of it. Maybe I should turn it on so that it helps. All right. Reason number one, motivation number one. We see Christ because we have died with Christ. We see Christ because we have died with Christ. 
That's simply how verse 3 starts, doesn't it? For you have died. For you have died. And generally speaking, we have died with Christ as a part of our union with Christ. That was the theological term that we threw out last time. That if you're a Christian, you are united with Christ in this sense. You are spiritually one with Christ. You, are, you have this. You experience union with Christ. This is something that we already started to see a little bit in the book of Colossians. Back in chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, we read, Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. So seeing the clear, the clear process that has happened for believers, that we were dead and we were brought back to life. We died with Christ and we now have been raised to newness of life. As Paul said elsewhere in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. Not in a literal sense, but in a, a spiritual sense. I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And so when we think about this concept that we have died, we can actually explore it a little bit. We've died in more than one way, you might realize. When we look at what the New Testament says, we realize there's a few different implications of this very phrase, for you have died. First, we can say that we have died to this world in its ways. We've died to this world in its ways. Colossians 2.20, again, says, If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world. Why is if you were still alive in the world, you submit to regulations? So in our dying spiritually with Christ, we die to the world in its ways. Paul says it even more powerfully in Galatians 6, verse 14. But far be it for me to boast, except in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me, and I to the world. The world has been crucified to me, and I to the world. So if we're saying this this morning, that we are in Christ and we have died to the ways of the world. There's another sense that we've died, though. We've also died to our sinful flesh. Romans 6 paints this beautifully. We can read the entire chapter to see it. But I'll also give you some highlights. Romans 6, verse 2, Paul says, How can we who die to sin still live in it? For a Christian, we have not just died to the ways of the world. We have died to sin, our sinful flesh. He goes on in Romans 6, in verses 5 through 11, to say this. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died to sin... Once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. We have died not just to the ways of the world, but we died to our sinful flesh. But we can say more, there's a third way. We have also died to the Old Testament law and its condemnation and its regulations. Romans 7, verses 5 and 6 says this. For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law... We're at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. So there's a lot built into this. To say this phrase simply that as believers we have died, we really need to think about what that means and all the implications. If we have died with Christ, there's a lot attached to this, isn't there? We've died to the ways of this world and how this world thinks and its pursuits and ambitions. We've, designed, we've died to our old selves and our old desires and, and our ambitions and our sin. We've died even to the condemnation that the law would bring. Think of simply the Ten Commandments. And every one of us could go through that test of whether or not we perfectly upheld the Ten Commandments and we would all fall short. But we have died to that even. We've been released from the law. We've died with Christ. So what? What does dying with Christ have to do with seeking Christ? If we die to the world, then there is nothing left outside of us to seek. The world has nothing to offer for you to seek. If we die to our flesh, then there's nothing left inside of us to seek. Because everything that comes from within is just evil and wretched to begin with. And if we die to the law, then there's nothing left condemning us. Because there is no law hanging over us. So if we die with Christ, the implication is huge. We're finally free. 
we're finally free. We have actually experienced freedom. The jail cell has sprung open. The chains have been released. The prison sentence has been completed and the debt has been paid. With the penalty of sin removed and the power of sin weakened, we can finally leap for joy. That's what this means. As the, the, the hymn, Oh, for a Thousand Tongues. His love my heart has captive made, his captive would I be. For he was bound and scourged and died, my captive soul to free. He breaks the power of canceled sin. He sets the prisoner free. His blood can make the foulest clean. His blood avail for me. We can live lives of freedom characterized no longer by slavish, habitual sinning, but instead lives of freedom characterized by seeking Christ. That's what this means. We seek Christ because we died and we are now free to do so. We're finally free to seek Christ. That's why we do it. We see Christ because we can. Before we could not. We couldn't. All we could do is fall right in line with the, the slavish tendencies of our flesh. All we could do is serve that master and we could not serve the one true God. But when we die with Christ, that all changed. We're now free to serve Christ, to seek him. So as a church, let's not go back to sinful and worldly practices that plague every human organization on the planet. Let's live like we're free to pray together and for one another. Let's live like we're free to come together around the Word of God. Let's live like we're free to sing praises together, because we finally are. Let's live like we're free to encourage and help one another become more like Christ. Let's live like we're free so that the world ponders the deceitful meaning of their own freedom, while we know true eternal freedom. We see Christ and the world says, hmm, looks like you're putting yourself under a bunch of rules. And we say, actually, no, we're the ones that are free. All you can do is serve the same master over and over again. You continue to submit to your flesh, and you continue to give into your sin, and you go right back to those old habits, and you do whatever the world puts in front of you. It might look shiny and new and fancy to you, but you go right after it, and you know what that means? You're a slave. You're a slave to this world. You're a slave to your flesh. Condemnation is over you because of it. But we've died. We've died with Christ. We're no longer slaves to the flesh. We're no longer captivated by this world. We're no longer having condemnation hanging over us because of the law. We're released from that. We're free. Free to see Christ. As individuals, let's not go back to sinful worldly practices that plague our own selves. Let's, let's live like we're free to daily see Christ in his word. Let's live like we're free to talk to God and he actually hears us. Let's live like we're free to serve other people rather than expect others to serve us. Let's live like we're free to show and tell the world the greatness of Christ over all things. We have died with Christ, and thus we are free to see Christ. As one commentator put it, setting our hearts and minds on the things above and not on earthly things is possible because our union with Christ severs us from the tyranny of the powers of this world and provides us with all the power needed to live a new life. Praise God. We are free because we died with Christ. That's one good reason that you should see Christ, that you should find absolute joy every morning to see Christ, because you died to all that old stuff. And you now can actually follow the one true God. Let me give you a second reason. It's found in the rest of verse 3. The second reason, the second motivation for seeking Christ, we seek Christ because we dwell with Christ. We seek Christ because we dwell with Christ. The verse goes on. And your life is hidden with Christ in God. And your life is hidden with Christ in God. The theological concept of our union with Christ continues with this phrase. We have not only died with Christ, we have been raised with Christ, as we see in other places already. So we're, we are currently dwelling with Christ in God. Paul had already clearly spoken to our spiritual resurrection with Christ in Colossians. Back in chapter 2, you look at verse 13, and what do we read? You who are dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh... God made alive together with him. Union with Christ and being resurrected with him spiritually. We just saw this back in verse 1 of the same chapter. Look at how verse 1 started in chapter 3. If then, or since then, you have been raised with Christ. This is what we know. 
Elsewhere, Paul speaks just as clearly about our being raised with Christ even into the heavenlies. In Ephesians 2, 4 through 6, he takes it a step further. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Not just there, though. Not just made us alive together with Christ. Verse 6 of Ephesians 2. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. But you'll notice in our text that Paul says something even more specific than that. Specifically, Paul says that our lives have been hidden with Christ in God. Our lives have been hidden with Christ in God. Thus, it seems Paul has this particular interest beyond restating the fact of our resurrection and exaltation with Christ to the heavenlies, as amazing as that is. Paul is claiming that our union with Christ means that we have been resurrected to a secure and safe position with him in the heavenlies. It's perhaps the most biblically logical defense for the security of our salvation. That is, true believers in Jesus Christ cannot and will not lose their salvation in Christ. How do we know this? Because, as our text argues, if true believers have died with Christ and have been raised to newness of life with Christ and are said to be hidden with Christ in God, then they aren't leaving Christ's side. That's for sure. They are secure and safe with Christ in heaven. A commentator said it this way. The resurrection lives of believers are intimately connected with the risen heavenly life of Christ. It is implied that in a spiritual, real sense, believers are already living in the company of Christ, in the heavenly realm. All this being hidden from human gaze. We're already in the company of Christ, spiritually speaking. We are safe and secure with Christ. Our life is hidden with Christ in God, as Paul says. To add to this argument, Paul is utilizing a unique verb tense in the Greek language when he said that your life is hidden with Christ. This is not the past tense, so he's not saying that our lives were hidden with Christ at one point in time in the past. And it's not the present tense, indicating that our lives are still in the process of being hidden right now in Christ. It's the perfect tense, which at its most basic interpretation means a past action with ongoing consequences. Thus, our lives have been hidden with Christ, is another way we can say it. It indicates that our lives were hidden with Christ in the past, it happens, and the ramifications are still being felt in our permanent heavenly position with Christ. A couple commentators speak to this. They say that this word, being hidden, alludes to the permanent outcome of rising with Christ in baptism. The true life of believers now lies hidden or remains concealed until the final revelation. Security, as well as concealment, is implied. Another commentator writes, Hidden connotes that God fully completed the action in the past with permanent results. We might add another point to Paul's argument of the eternal security of our salvation. Notice that Paul states our lives are hidden with Christ in God. Our lives are hidden with Christ in God. Christ is not only involved in our spiritual dwelling with him in heaven. Naturally, our spiritual presence with Christ in heaven involves a spiritual presence with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Father. Another commentator writes, The triune Godhead is presently at work keeping us safe and secure, and our union is with God as well as with Christ. To add a final point, the very word that Paul has chosen, hidden, the word hidden implies the safety and security of all those who are said to be hidden with Christ. Hidden implies both concealment and safety, both invisibility and security. He is not yet glorified, but he is secure and safe in Christ, one writer says. Looking at it from more of a dictionary standpoint, one writer says, Paul may intend another nuance in asserting that our lives are hidden with God. Really, in this verse, under the meaning hide in a safe place is probably a better translation. This extension of meaning is quite natural since hiding is often the way that people find safety and security when enemies are pursuing them. It may, it may remind us that the time between our initial identification with Christ and the revelation of the status on the last day is a time when God is working to keep us secure in that relationship. This is the natural meaning of this word here, hidden. It reminds us of Psalm 27, 5, 
when the writer says, He will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. We are hidden, and that means we are safe. We are protected. We are with him. These statements of our salvation being secure and hidden in heaven, protected by God for us, they sound very nice. But is this what Scripture affirms? Our answer has to be yes, not just from this verse. For those who are in Christ, your salvation is in fact secure. It is hidden. It is reserved in heaven for you. As Colossians 1 said earlier in verses 3 through 5, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. It's a certain hope. Peter says the same thing in 1 Peter 1, verses 3 through 5, when he describes this hope. In verse 4, he says, it is, it is an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Scripture keeps affirming this. This is not a, a, a nice picture just to throw out there to say, you are spiritually somewhere out there with Jesus in the sky. No. You are secure. You are hidden. Your salvation is done and accomplished with Christ even now and his Father in heaven. Perhaps the words of Jesus will remind you of this teaching. In John 10, 27 30, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life. And they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. If we have come to know Christ as our Savior and King, then our eternal life is secure with Him in heaven. So what does this mean for us right now? That we can relax. We can sit back. We can cruise, assume the position of a soldier at ease. Absolutely not. Quite the opposite. Our secure salvation in heaven should motivate us. Should motivate us to see Christ that much more boldly. It's a matter of identity. Now that this is true for Christians, our citizenship is now in heaven, and we must act like it. We must act like a citizen of heaven while still occupying this brief temporary body on earth. Our true identity is hidden with Christ in God. Let us therefore live like it while still on earth. If you think about it, what do the best universities love to do? When they pitch their school and they talk about how great their university is, the top notch, ranked highest in the country, they love to appeal to their alumni. And say, look at what our graduates have done. Look, look at all that they've gone on to accomplish. Look at how much money they're making. Look at the type of companies that they started. Look at the impact they're having on this world. Look at how they're transforming society. These are our graduates from our university. Do the graduates of these top-notch universities feel like they need to earn the praise of their former institutions? Is that why they go out and do all that? Do they leave their university and say, okay, i got to make Harvard proud, so I better go make a lot of money. I'm going to have to come back and talk to Harvard someday, so I better start another company. Is that why? Absolutely not. They're done with Harvard. They're done with Yale. They're done with these top schools. Why would they need their institution's approval later on in life? They don't. The graduates of these top-notch institutions go on and do big and great things because that's simply who they are. That's just who they are. They are people, and this is our identity, that they are people of pursuing and achieving greatness. That's probably how they got into those top-notch schools, and that's what they're going to do, regardless of their connection to those schools later on in life. That's just who they are. That's their identity. Similarly, we can say this is the case of the believer. We don't work hard to earn our salvation or our spot in heaven. No. Our salvation is secure. We know that. Our spot in heaven is hidden and reserved for us. Yet, while on earth, we seek Christ. Why? Why try so hard? Because this is who we are. It's our identity. This is who you are. A follower of Christ and one who seeks and loves Christ. We are those who have died to our old selves with Christ. And we are those who have been raised to the newness of life with Christ. And we are those who are spiritually seated in the heavens with Christ. Since all this is true, every moment of our earthly existence will be in pursuit of Christ. 
We know the very thing that has transformed our life entirely is Christ. And now that becomes our identity. And so how do we live? We live for Christ. We see Christ. We don't sit back. We don't say, oh, this is a nice time to be casual and say, that free gift was great, Jesus. Thank you. I'll just kind of rest until you take me home. No, we recognize that that transformation was only because of Jesus and his grace. And now we are a completely new creature. And thus we live in Christ. And we live every day like that. Until he calls us home. It's simply who we are. If we dwell with Christ, then we see Christ. Let me give you a third reason and a third motivation that we find in verse 4. We see Christ because we desire Christ. We see Christ because we desire Christ. Look at how verse 4 starts. When Christ, who is your life, appears... When Christ, who is your life, appears. Embedded into this statement, you can almost just read over it and not think much of it. But there's a phrase that deserves our attention. And hopefully we've drawn attention to it. Other versions beyond the ESV might actually punctuate this English text in such a way as to draw attention to this phrase. I'll put some of them up here. The ESV is that top one there. And it just says, when Christ who is your life appears, and you can just move on. But look at some of these other translations. They do a good job saying, when Christ, comma, who is our life, then moving on, is revealed. When Christ who is your life, in parenthesis there, to show, to draw attention to it, that he is our life. And that's a, that's a comment worth reflecting on for a moment. What is Paul's point on this? Christ is life. That's simple. Christ is life. And certainly you've seen the, the various tributes that people give to their, their hobbies and pastimes and sports. Ball is life. You know, I'm all about that. Right? So you remember the, the sports chalet license plate holders? I'd rather be fill in the blank, hiking. I'd rather be kayaking. I'd rather be fishing or playing volleyball. And that's life. And for many athletes, it's true. You can see that their life has been truly consumed by a sport. Right? It's not just because they say it. Basketball is my life. Or I eat, drink, and sleep baseball. But when an athlete is actually given to these things, you see it truly does dominate everything they do. And you see it even more so when they get injured. Because the second they get injured and they can't do their very sport, the very thing that's their identity, they crumble. They crumble into the depression and they don't know what to do with themselves. Their identity has been fractured. They have no idea what to do. Why? Because that sport was truly their life in every sense. Their respective sport is their life. In an even greater sense, we might say for the believer, and we do say that Christ is life. The commentator says it this way. Paul underscores the significance of Christ for the believer. Jesus is not peripheral to life. He is life. He imparts God's life. And he is the center around which life should be oriented. Another writer said this. It is Christ. In the sense that Christ is the source, center, and goal of the individual and corporate lives of believers. He's everything for us. And if we think back over our study on the book of Colossians, this really shouldn't be surprising for us. Paul has pressed the theme of Christ's supremacy. Christ is overall. Paul has made that abundantly clear, and that's been his goal so far in this book. Just recall some of these statements back in chapter 1. Colossians 1, verses 15 through 20, this great praise and adoration to Christ that even some of the children in children's church are trying to memorize. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, and making peace by the blood of his cross. Christ is supreme. He's preeminent. He's before all. He's over all. He made all. Colossians 2.3, we learn that Christ is the one in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and in knowledge. And plainly in Colossians 2, verses 9 and 10, For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him, who is the head of all rule and authority. He's God. So when we find a statement like the one that we find here, 
in chapter 3, verse 4, we're not surprised. Christ is our life. Another writer says, the centrality of Christ in Colossians blazes into view again. Believers know that Christ is their life. But the fact of Christ being our very life as believers is attested elsewhere in Scripture, as you will know. Christ was the theme of Paul's life. As he went on to say in Galatians 2.20, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And even the life I live now in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and he gave himself for me. So a verse that I perhaps referenced in the last four sermons, I don't know if I'm going to stop, it is Philippians 1.21, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. What about Jesus himself? This doesn't surprise us because of what Jesus taught. In John 14.6, it was Jesus that said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so we encounter an obvious question for ourselves this morning. When we examine our church, can it be stated without reservation that Christ is our life? Oh, well, you come to Mission Community Church, they're all about Christ. Christ is their life. Christ is the very pulse and heartbeat of that church. Unfortunately, many pursuits other than Christ can subsume churches. There can be fun, there can be relationships and events and activities, but Christ can be completely absent from all of it. And if we're not careful, we can become a shell of a church, just like the church at Ephesus in the book of Revelation. Jesus' rebuke to the Ephesians in Revelation 2 was plain and simple. Revelation 2, 4. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Churches can do this. And it's sneaky. It's not obvious because all the external things are there. All the visible manifestations are there. But deep down, love is gone. Love for Christ is absent. May God protect us from allowing our hearts to be distracted away from loving Christ as a church. How about as individuals? When we examine ourselves, can it be stated without reservation that Christ is your life? Just like churches, individuals are all prone to wander away from Christ. We can fill our lives with all kinds of pursuits and hobbies and joys and tasks. We can give lip service to Christ and say that we love Him. But all the while, our love for Christ is empty and dried up. If that's the case with you this morning, I, I, I plead you to confront this reality in your heart and in your life. Confess your lack of love for Christ. Go right to Him. Go right to the throne where there's mercy and grace and say, I know, and so do you, God, that the love is not there. Confess your sins. He will forgive you. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all righteousness. He will do that. That's what the cross accomplished. Ask God plainly to renew your love for Christ from your desires to your actions. Make the appropriate changes that will reorient your life, truly reorient your life, so that Christ is life. He is the center of everything you do. Let us, like Paul, sincerely say that Christ is our life. So we see Christ because we truly should desire Christ. Let's give a fourth and final motivation and reason this morning for seeking Christ. We seek Christ because our destination is Christ. Our destination is Christ. Verse 4 ends with this, Then you also will appear with him in glory. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. The final reason that Paul gives for why we must see Christ is because Christ is our destination. He is where we are going, fully, completely, in glory. We receive past and present motivations for seeking Christ. We should seek Christ because we have died. We should seek Christ because our life is hidden with Christ in God. We should seek Christ because He is our life right now. But here's a future motivation. We should seek Christ because when, when He appears, we also will appear with Him in glory. A writer says, So Paul added a new direction to the believer's focus of attention. They should look upward to Christ reign over them in heaven and also forward to his reign for them in the clouds. Paul appeals to the second coming of Christ, to the time when Christ will come back. As the author of Hebrews says in Hebrews 9, 28, So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time. 
not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. The second coming of Christ. The beauty of Paul's emphasis is our benefit in Christ's return. When Christ returns, you also, you also will appear with him in glory. The return of Christ means not only the revelation of Christ's glory, but also our sharing and our partaking in his glory. Many other New Testament passages speak to this future reality of Christ's return to our glory. 1 John 3, 2. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. Philippians 3, 20 and 21. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body. By the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 33, this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. That's what awaits us. Romans 8, 18 also has, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Glory is in our future. Christ's glory and us sharing with him is. Such future hope and glory ought to motivate us. And the certainty of Christ's return and glory and our reunion with him should propel us to see Christ now. One Puritan writer said this, Do we look for such a happiness? And should we not set our affections upon that world and live above this? What is there here to make us fond of it? What is there not there to draw our hearts to it? Our head is there, our home is there, our treasure is there, and we hope to be there forever. This is the case for us. And we know the end. We know the destination. We know the conclusion. It is glory with Christ. Why would we not seek Christ? Are we motivated by the return of our Savior? Are we longing for his return? Are we even aware of his return every day, as we ought to be? We must strive to be like the faithful servants who labor diligently, not knowing at what moment their master might return. We know our future so we can see Christ. And that's, that's what we've been commanded, to see Christ. This is our responsibility. This is our resolve. But there's good reasons for it, Christian. And I hope you believe that this morning. I hope you're convinced of that this morning. I hope you're encouraged if you're in that this morning. That these are the reasons, these are the motivations for why you have completely transformed and reoriented your life. You've made it completely centered on Christ. You've made decisions. You've made sacrifices. You've had hard conversations. You've actually tweaked your schedule. Maybe you changed your job. You've just reoriented everything. Why? Because Christ must be the center. He must be. And you have good reason for that. Because if you're in Christ, you've died to those old ways. You don't have to schedule your life like the world does. You don't have to do what the world does. You don't have to go back to those old habits and those old addictions. You don't have to go to that. You're free to see Christ. You've died to that. You dwell with Christ now. You know that your life is, it is hidden, and it is secure, and it is safe. And so that's who you are, so you see Christ now. You know that for a fact. You desire Christ. He's your life. In fact, you wouldn't know what to do with yourself. If you found out tomorrow that Christ didn't exist, your life would be completely upended. You could not go on because it has been so concentrated on him. And you know what the future holds. That excites you plenty. You don't care about how terrible things look right now and how things feel. You know what the future holds. It's glory. Christ's glory. And you sharing in that glory. And so you seek him now. Many of you are already doing that. I pray that this is just more motivation to stay in that fight. Perhaps some of you are, have no idea this awareness. You feel like Christianity is kind of just a burden. It's just the way. I invite you to consider again the grace of God of Jesus Christ. That you can have sins forgiven at the cross. And then you're free. Seeking Christ is not a burden. It's a joy. If you don't know that, please ask. And join us in what is the most purposeful and beautiful way to live, to see Christ. He is our life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you as a church and as individuals, as parents, as children, as husbands, as wives, as grandparents, Lord, as employees and employers, 
All these things can be a part of our identity, but we know ultimately, God, Christ is our life. We pray that this would be a wonderful reminder for all of us this morning. Just to take some spiritual inventory, Lord, to make sure that our life is truly obsessed with Christ. That we desire and we seek Christ above all else because he is supreme over all. May we give him that attention. And may you please help us, God. Help us to say no to these old worldly ways and habits and to run after Christ. Let us enjoy that together as a body as well as a congregation. We pray this in your name. Amen. Thank you for taking part in our Bible study. We invite you to subscribe to both the podcast and our YouTube channel and visit our Facebook page. We are also on Instagram. If you want to know more about MCC and our various ministries, or if you simply have a question about the Bible or what it means to be a Christian, a Jesus follower, please leave your thoughts and questions in the comment section below this video. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next time.